Um, I am so excited to introduce our first speaker. Um, Quinn Reed is one of my uh, favorite people ever. Um, she's my mentor. She's um, uh, someone who I reach out to for any, you know, wildlife questions on policy. Um, she knows everything. And so I'm super stoked to um, not only have her here, but um, I get to introduce her as well. So Quinn Reed is the Oregon Policy Director for the Center for Biological Diversity. She works to protect and restore Oregon's imperiled species and landscapes. Prior to joining the center, Quinn worked as the Northwest Program Director at Defenders of Wildlife. She holds a bachelor's degree in political science from the University of Washington and a law degree from the University of San Diego School of Law. And I'll turn it over to you, Quinn. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Um, I am just looking for the option to share my screen, Amanda. Perfect. Um, I'll, if you're comfortable doing so, it would not hurt my feelings if folks turned on their video. It just makes me feel a little bit less like I'm talking into an empty void. So <laughs> only if you're comfortable, but um, I would love to see your faces as, as we go through this, this presentation. Um, so as Steph mentioned, I am the Oregon Policy Director for the Center for Biological Diversity. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging that I am talking to you from my home in Portland on the unceded lands of the Chinook, Clackamas, and Cowlitz people. I'm so grateful to be here today, although I wish it could be in person, um, to talk about the conservation of wolves and, and wildlife. But we can't have this conversation without recognizing the people who were the original stewards and protectors of the wildlife and lands we hold dear. It's admittedly jarring to shift to a conversation about fish and wildlife policy, given that our current systems of wildlife conservation and, and management, I kind of use management in quotes, um, are so firmly rooted in the exploitation of the original people of this land and its natural resources. So why are we talking about fish and wildlife commission reform? For those of us who care about protecting wolves and other wildlife, it is imperative that we understand how decisions are made and who makes those decisions. We have to increase our understanding so that we can better navigate systems of power and so that we can influence policy. But even more important, we have to increase our understanding so that we can begin to dismantle and remake these systems of power. Today, authority over wildlife conservation and management in the US is shared between the federal and state government. Within the states, there are generally two two governance models. In one, boards and commissions make policy decisions and oversee fish and wildlife agencies or fish and game agencies, depending on the state. In the other, political appointees make policy decisions and oversee an agency. But how did this system come to be? To really understand how we got here, we have to look all the way back to the European colonization of North America. The westward expansion of colonizers was characterized by the genocide of indigenous peoples and cultures and the unfettered exploitation of natural resources. For a long, long time, there was no legal framework to regulate the killing or taking of wildlife. Some of the trends that influenced our evolution, the evolution of wildlife conservation and um, include the growing market for wildlife um, as urban centers grew and created demand for wildlife to feed and dress themselves. Um, increased development associated with westward expansion destroyed wildlife habitat. At the same time, indigenous cultural resources were often explicitly targeted and eliminated by colonizers. At the same time, we had the emergence of a middle class. This middle class started to have more leisure time and this started to give rise to the growth of sport hunting. Also along with this, we saw this dynamic of predator species being killed either as pests 
or as perceived competition for game species. What all this meant is that by the turn of the 20th century, many species had been pushed to the brink of extinction or beyond. So recognizing that there was a serious problem, starting in the mid to late 1800s, conservationists, many of whom were sportsmen, and I use the term sportsmen very intentionally here, um, emphasis on the men part, um, began to organize and advocate for the preservation of wilderness areas and wildlife. So in the ensuing years, there were a number of important laws passed, um, including the Migratory Bird Treaty Act of 1918, the Migratory Bird Hunting and Conservation Stamp Act of 1934, the Federal Aid and Wildlife Restoration Act of 1937, and more. So collectively, these acts and others laid the foundation for what inspired what we know today as the North American model of conservation. I included this picture, this is an image from the 1909 North American Conservation Congress. And I have it here as an example of the decision makers who were behind these early conservation efforts. I would invite all of you to take a very close look to see who is represented and who is not represented. Quite stark. So here we have the seven tenets or pillars of the North American model of wildlife conservation. The model is not itself legally binding. It really is a set of abstract principles that came, you know, were derived from some of these early conservation acts um, and then guided future conservation acts and statutes as they were developed. Regardless, even though it's not legally binding in and of itself, this model forms the basis of our current system of wildlife conservation and management and is widely accepted by wildlife professionals and agencies. I want to mention that these collective efforts undoubtedly helped restore populations of many mostly game species. But we need to acknowledge that our system of wildlife conservation and management originated in exploitation and was written by and for sportsmen. This is in no way meant to denigrate sportsmen and women, but today's wildlife and habitat conservation needs are fundamentally different and call for a different system. Um, this was recently driven home for me at a recent hearing of the Oregon Fish and Wildlife Commission. Um, Suzanne Foudy, who I believe you will all hear from tomorrow, led an effort to ban beaver trapping on federally managed public lands. This issue was so controversial in Oregon that it led to a 12-hour virtual hearing. Now, this hearing happened in the backdrop of the explosion of the Black Lives Matter movement into the forefront of American consciousness. So I'm sitting, again, in my home, you know, logged on to this virtual hearing for, for 12 hours. Um, at times, I could hear explosions from downtown Portland I'm, I've got the news in my background on, on my computer trying to figure out what's going on and, and, and that, and then listening to the hearing, I had to hear time and time again from folks, predominantly white men, talk about their legacy or tradition of hunting and trapping. Um, it was, I, I think these two things juxtaposed um, was, it was so striking to me. Um, you know, our current system really seems to exist in a vacuum. Um, state fish and wildlife agencies and commissions have created a safe place to celebrate and uphold these so-called legacies of exploitation and killing. So let's talk a little bit about how 
these models and these systems are implemented at the state level. Um, I'll be using Oregon as a model because it's where I do my work. And um, in another life, we would have been meeting in person here. Um, although different states have variations on wildlife governance, um, the broader issues and trends largely translate across state borders. Okay. So here we just have a snapshot of the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife's um, mission. And it's a good one, to protect and enhance Oregon's fish and wildlife and their habitats for use and enjoyment by present and future generations. Um, a lot of conservation organizations have very similar mission revision statements. Um, ODFW um, has a model that consists of a commission, a commission appointed director, and a statewide staff of around 1,000. So the commission is important because it is a policy and rulemaking body. They are the ones making important decisions about the conservation and management of fish and wildlife, including wolves and other imperiled species. There are seven members of the commission. They are all appointed by the governor and confirmed by the Senate for four-year terms. The commission is led by a governor-appointed chair, which is fairly typical. And in making appointments to the commission, by statute, the governor shall consider appointing members who possess natural resources backgrounds, such as backgrounds in commercial fishing, recreational fishing, hunting, agriculture, forestry, and conservation. Now, this is interesting because this um, language is shall consider, right? Um, these are backgrounds that the governor should take into consideration while she's looking at potential applicants. Um, I have this very boring slide of text here, mainly for this underlined portion, which is to emphasize that all members of the commission are supposed to, not supposed to, shall represent the public interest of the state. So regardless of background, regardless of the region of the state from which they, um, from which they come, they are supposed to represent all of us. So again, each, our seven commissioners in Oregon come from each of our congressional districts. We have five. In addition, there is one Western at large seat and one Eastern at large seat. And I have to keep coming back to this point. The commissioner for congressional district four doesn't represent congressional district four. The commissioner from congressional district four represents everyone in the state of Oregon. That is the intent. In practice, it looks a little bit different. Um, <laughs> let me go back to this. Um, this all seems fairly straightforward, but what does it look like in practice? Um, you know, how do folks even end up on the commission? If you or I wanted to be on the commission, how would we even go about doing it? Um, if you go to the Oregon Board and Commission's website, you know, you'll find a, a a fairly straightforward how-to guide for applying, but once you submit your application, it disappears into the back channels of bureaucracy. Indeed, um, you know, we've had applicants from the conservation community whose applications have disappeared um, and, and never saw the light of day by any decision maker. Um, so in practice, appointments are based on political connections, who you know. Um, support or opposition from particular powerful interest groups, um, and then a vague perception about whether a person is confirmable. But never forget that Governor Kate Brown nominated someone whose social media profile was splashed with images like this. So our governor thought that this person was confirmable and that this person could accurately represent the interests of all Oregon. So these are the current commissioners in Oregon, which is not particularly relevant to those of you who aren't in Oregon, but um, for those who are, I bring it up to showcase that there are potentially three commission seats at play this year. So we have a vacant Western at large seat, and then we have two seats um, whose the current um, commissioners, the terms have actually expired already. Um, Greg Woolley, the commission's 
first and only person of color to have served. Um, his term expired in May. Um, Bob Spellbrink, uh, his term, although he's just finishing his first, expired in May as well, but he is up for potential reappointment. So this commission, and I want to make this really clear because these issues that you see on the slide before you um, were largely the result of the previous commission. Um, the new faces are you know, largely untested, but there are big issues ahead related to beaver trapping or protecting marble murrelet. Um, you know, these are the people who are going to determine the future of wolf conservation in Oregon. And we need to pay attention to who they are and how they make their decisions because this is the record over the last few years. You know, we saw, um, contrary to um, broad public opposition, the commission removed wolves from the state endangered species list. Um, they decided to continue gill netting on the Columbia River and um, violating longstanding agreements with the state of Washington. Um, they have supported killing sea lions to save protected fish. Um, they reversed their own decision to list marble murrelets as a state endangered species. So this is the kind of trend that we're seeing um, in Oregon, and I think it's certainly true for many other state fish and wildlife commissions, and this is the kind of trend that we have to stop and reverse. So, what's the problem, right? I mean, this kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier with the North American model. Um, you know, when you have a um, sportsman-created, sportsman-led model that's designed to meet the needs of sportsmen, it's going, and that provides the basis for wildlife management, it's going to skew the way that wildlife policy is made. Um, it certainly skews the way that state fish and wildlife agencies are funded. So what we see um, really across the country at the state level is this user pay and user benefit model. So like many other state agencies, ODFW has received the majority of its funding from hunting and fishing licensees, and federal excise taxes on ammo, firearms, and fishing gear. As a result, hunting and fishing interests are perceived as the primary customer of the agency. And I have heard that language time and time again from ODFW Director Kurt Melcher. So huntable and fishable species are perceived as the highest priority, with relatively little resources devoted to non-game or imperiled wildlife. As taxpayers, this should offend all of us. Um, the trend that we've seen in recent decades is a steady decline in participation in hunting and fishing. And when your entire model is dependent upon revenue from those activities, it's setting up a recipe for some serious budget shortfalls, which has happened. Um, ODFW um, has sought significantly more general fund dollars from the public, but we've yet to see this corresponding shift to address the broader public interest in conservation. Um, in 2019, the legislator created the Oregon Conservation and Recreation Fund, um, and that's a hopeful sign of some shifts, but it is in its very early stages, um, so we'll have more about whether or not that's helping to shift dynamics probably in the next couple of years. All right, so what are some of the other dynamics at play here? So there is little to no racial diversity. And again, if you look at the um, pictures of commission, uh, fish and wildlife or fish and game boards and commissions across the country, this trend continues to play out, but it is certainly true in Oregon. Um, there is little to no racial diversity, let alone any other kind of diversity. Um, this should appall us, but it shouldn't surprise us given the origins of this system. Um, Oregon is an extremely white state with anti-blackness written into the Constitution. Um, there are other things that contribute to this dynamic, including things like, you know, commissioners, it's a huge time commitment. It's a, you know, the kind of expertise and commitment that we ask of commissioners is a lot. 
And these are unpaid positions, um, which means that service is effectively limited to financially secure retirees. I mean, that's not an inclusive model. It's not a way to increase participation among you know, people who have to work for a living. Um, you know, we have this dynamic where special interests drive commission appointments. So despite what's written in statute, in practice, there is a one seat per interest group model. And this is a dynamic that does not support increasing racial diversity on the commission by any means. Um, but you know, this model also means that commissioners often represent the very interest they're supposed to be regulated. You know, we also have a situation where conflicts of interest are ignored. Um, this was explicit, you know, during the update of the Wolf Plan, um, you know, where we had a commissioner who was married to a lobbyist from the Oregon Hunters Association. Um, you know, it's, this is the kind of conflict that is routinely overlooked. Um, the appointment process is a mystery. Like I was saying early, earlier, um, you know, you can look online and you can see the alleged steps, but really it's kind of a black box. And I think a lot of people probably self-select out um, just because of this perception that um, it's totally based on political connections. I shouldn't say the perception, the perception and the reality that it's based on political connections. Um, you know, the, the governor's interest in advancing certain candidates is unpredictable and unreliable. It's, it's tough. I mean, I, I think um, we have a lot to do to increase clarity around how people can actually be appointed. Um, the culture of the commission is not conducive to public participation. As we were talking about before, commissioners prioritize input from people they perceive as being their primary customers. Um, time and time again, I have seen folks who have taken time out of their day to testify in person before the commission um, to protect wildlife and um, be belittled, or in one very notable case, even threatened with arrest for expressing a viewpoint. Um, it's a very troubling dynamic. Um, beyond that, commissioners, and I was shocked to realize this, I talked to a newly appointed commissioner a couple of years ago, um, who's no longer on the commission, <laughs> um, unsurprisingly, um, but they received no official onboarding or training. So that means they don't understand the agency's broad conservation mission. They don't understand that their obligation is to the broader public. They're supposed to serve the public interest. So if you come into it cold and the person who, you know, or the, you have a special interest group who supported your candidacy and you believe that you're accountable only to them, that's a problem. Um, you know, I have a, the same person who told me that there was no onboarding. Um, and this was a commissioner again who's no longer, uh, he stepped down in the last couple of years. You know, he said, well, you know, yeah, there's, I got a big binder with a handbook, but that's about it. So the first thing I did was reach out to the Oregon Hunters Association and the Oregon Cattlemen's Association, because that was who he perceived as being his primary constituents. I mean, he came from a sport fishing background. So that just tells you a lot about sort of the general perception of what the agency is supposed to be doing. So what else? Um, this one is pretty self-explanatory and infuriating. Politics takes precedence over science time and time again. Um, you know, as advocates, this is tough because we want to present data. We want to present science. And we want decisions to be based on that science. Um, but the reality is, no matter how solid your base of science is, it doesn't matter unless you have the votes. Um, you know, for me in my position, one of the most difficult and heartbreaking things is to, you know, be talking to activists about how their voice matters and the importance of public process and, um, and then to see them go out and be dismissed um, and to see them, you know, see us as a community lose, again, not because we didn't have 
the right arguments or the right facts or the right science, but because we didn't have the number of votes. Um, it's really tough. Um, and then the other dynamic, even before we have people on the commission, is that the, appoint the appointments themselves are often used as political trading stock by the governor and in the legislature. Um, you know, the governor once used um, a slate of commission appointments um, as a trade to pass um, a transportation package, which then failed anyway. So, um, you know, maybe that speaks to, you know, where wildlife conservation falls in the hierarchy of conservation issues in Oregon um, from the viewpoint of, of politicians, but it's certainly a problem. So, what do we do? I mean, I think the most obvious and perhaps for me the most desirable thing to do would be to scrap the whole damn system and start from scratch. And I think there are um, there's some really interesting conversations about what that could look like. Um, what kind of system could we build that meets the conservation needs of today? Um, but as we work forward to think about what a rebuilt or remade system could look like, We've got a lot of species going extinct. We have a lot of habitat that's being obliterated. So what can we do? So I've got a list of things that um, I think are, are important opportunities for us to shift dynamics in the system as it exists now. Um, <clears throat> so one, of course, is to prioritize the appointment of people who identify as Black, Indigenous, or people of color, and to be explicit about this. Um, we often use sort of vague, coded language, but let's be explicit. We need more BIPOC people represented on the Fish and Wildlife Commission. Um, correlated with that is to reject the one seat per interest group model. We should also reject prescriptive appointment criteria. When we start to say, well, you have to have this background, this education, this, we're, we're just limiting the pool of potentially fantastic applicants. We should be supporting informed and thoughtful candidates who care about conserving fish and wildlife and habitat, and who will prioritize science, who will value public process and respect members of the public, and who will reflect the members or the values of majority of Oregonians who don't hunt or fish. You know, we can make sure that there's adequate onboarding for new commissioners that they have a chance and in fact are required to meet with a broad array of interest groups so they can understand the broad public interest they are supposed to represent. Um, you know, we can improve, well, sorry, improve compensation. Currently there's virtually no compensation. We can um, create compensation for commissioners to enable more members of the public to serve without sacrificing necessary income. And we can improve transparency around conflicts of interest and require commissioners to recuse themselves from votes where they have to So to that end, what are we doing? Um, you know, I'm working certainly with the center and with many partners uh, as part of the Oregon Wildlife Coalition to engage, empower, and endorse candidates. So we're trying to do more of this, right? Educate people about the role of the commission in wildlife and habitat conservation because you know, to the general public, um, again, it's sort of a, a mystery how wildlife conservation policy is made and how important the commission is in making it. Um, you know, we want to demystify the appointment process. We want to conduct direct outreach um, to engage emerging community leaders. Um, you know, we want to identify candidates for current and future vacancies, not just these three that are available now, but five, 10, 15 years in the future, you know, what connections are we making with BIPOC youth, you know, that might result in leaders serving on state boards and commissions 15 years in the future? Um, you know, we're advocating for compensation for commissioners. And we want to hold the commission to the same standard now being used to transform workplace culture at the Oregon Capitol, which is to provide a safe and supportive environment for all who work or engage in the commission process. And finally, we're working directly with the governor and members of the Senate to address these issues and help new candidates gain traction. 
but what are we really doing, right? It's, it's easy, I'm gonna go back to this slide. It's really easy to say all this stuff. It's really easy to be like, here are the things we're advocating for. Here are the things that I say out loud. Um, here are the things I put on a brochure or sending an email to a senator. But what are we really doing? And I offer some questions here as we head into the Q&A portion of, of this talk for us to think and reflect on. Um, because to really take meaningful action, you know, we have to ask ourselves some tough questions and do some soul searching and hold ourselves accountable. You know, are we reacting, um, are we operating reactively or proactively? Are we really committed to the long-term relationship building and support of BIPOC leaders and youth? Are we even too entrenched in the system to think creatively? Like, are, are we, you know, the conservation professionals like me, who this is, this is the framework that we've been working in for years, right? Are we the right people? Who else can inform what a new system would look like? You know, how do we look outside of our entrenched community to come up with new ideas? How diverse are our personal and professional networks? Um, you know, I'll be honest with you, this is sort of taking our community to, to task here. Um, a couple of years ago, when there were um, some commission vacancies, uh, we put out a call, you know, to uh, some major listservs, you know, to say, hey folks, there's these vacancies. Um, you know, we'd love to get your thoughts on potential candidates. Um, you know, we'd love to see more people of color, more women, um, younger folks, people with, you know, young families. Yeah, we'd just like to see more diversity in the commission. And I don't think we, and this is going out to the conservation community, I don't think we received a single name of a person who was not white. So when we look at our own communities, <laughs> we have to be really critical and think about what we are doing to expand our networks and to be inclusive because otherwise we're going to just find ourselves in the same boat the next time there's a slate of, of vacancies and looking around going, oh, crap, we don't know. We don't have any names. We don't, we don't, we don't know people. We don't have people in our exclusive community. So this is tough work. Um, you know, we need to think about how our internal and implicit biases influence our view of potential or of, of potential commission candidates. You know, if we, we're so used to speaking a particular um, bureaucratic language, um, it's almost second nature. And I think that, you know, we might overlook people who don't speak that very particular language, even though they could bring a much needed thoughtfulness to the commission. Um, so looking at even just the nature of our, the language that we use as a community, um, is important. So I, there are more, and I think the, the big one, of course, is, you know, do we have the, the bravery, do we have the guts to say, if we did scrap it, like, let's do that and start again. What would that even look like? Um, so those are things I offer, you know, up to the group um, to think about and perhaps discuss during Q&A. Um, but before we do that, um, to wrap up and tie this back to our starting place, um, I really want to encourage you to support organizations that build leadership capacity among indigenous communities. So one such program is the Oregon LEAD program, and it's run by NIA, the Native American Youth and Family Center here in Portland. So Oregon LEAD provides in-depth skill building, professional training, and networking opportunities to affirm cultural identity and build a network of Native leaders statewide. So I would encourage you all to donate to NIA to support Oregon LEAD um, and other important programs at their website, which I've posted on this slide, NIAPDX.org. Um, and I'll leave that here just for a moment so that you can write it down if you wish. And with that, I will wrap it up. And I just want to say thank you all for your time today. And I especially want to thank Steph and Amanda and Rachel for organizing this fantastic conference and putting together um, such a diverse panel this first day. That takes a lot of intentionality and I'm, I'm grateful and excited to be part of this community.